Hello, and welcome to a lecture on the LC Feedback Oscillator. In this lecture, we'll be talking about the concept of the LC Feedback Oscillator. Here's an overview of this lecture. First, why oscillators? Uh, oscillators are a way of doing frequency synthesis. So really, we're asking the question, why frequency synthesis? Then I'll remind you what an LC resonator is. We'll talk about feedback oscillators, and we'll bring up this idea of Barkhausen criteria. Then I'll show you LC feedback architecture. That includes the Colpitts architecture, the Hartley architecture, and in the future lecture we'll talk about the CLAP architecture. You may recall a diagram like this from earlier in the course, uh, simply showing how functional blocks appear in radio systems. So for example, at the top, we have a transmitter where we have modulation, we have digital to analog conversion, we have up conversion because the D to A is typically not able to generate RF frequencies. In some cases we can do that, but usually we can't. And then a power amplifier and an antenna. And then we radiate the signal and the receiver receives it on an antenna. We have a low noise amplifier and we now have some idea of how those are designed. We down convert to a frequency which is accessible to an analog to digital converter and then we do demod. So this is one very common type of architecture. Well, to do the up conversion and the down conversion, we require frequency mixing, which will be the topic of a future lecture. And to do that, we require an oscillator. So one place, one prominent place where oscillators appear in radios is right here in these yellow blocks and they're used to do the conversion from higher to lower frequencies in receivers and lower to higher frequencies in transmitters. But that's not the only place they appear. For example, they appear in direct modulation. Uh, I may have discussed in a previous lecture the fact that in some transmitters we simply use an oscillator as the source of the signal. So we might have an oscillator and then a PA and then the antenna. And the oscillator is variable to introduce the modulation. So if we're doing AM, we might vary the oscillator's magnitude. If we're doing FM, we might vary its frequency and so on. We also use oscillators as sample clocks. The A to D here and the D to A here both sample according to a schedule. And so they require a clock. And that clock is a form of frequency synthesis. So uh, one way to do that is with an oscillator. Yet another application of oscillators in radio systems is this time bases. So it's very common to start off with a thing which we will refer to later as a crystal oscillator, abbreviated with the letters XO, as a common time base. So for example, it's very common to generate 10 megahertz with a crystal oscillator, and then to use that signal for a whole bunch of other oscillators, which might be for uh, local oscillators, they might be for clock signals, and so on. But if we distribute a time base in this way, and we require all the oscillators to use this, uh, we can ensure that all the signals are coherent. Now we will explain in a lecture further down the road that these will typically not be oscillators themselves, they'll be synthesizers, but that distinction is, is relatively minor at the moment. For now we're going to talk about oscillators, and in particular LC feedback oscillators. To begin, we introduce the LC resonator. You no doubt have seen this thing before earlier in your electrical engineering uh, program. It consists of a capacitor and an inductor. Very simple idea. The way you make an oscillator out of such a thing can be demonstrated using a very simple thought experiment. So we imagine that we apply some DC voltage across the terminals and uh, we let that sit for a while. And what have, will happen, of course, is we'll have positive charges build up along the top plate of the capacitor here, and negative charge build up along the bottom plate of the capacitor here. But that is, that's all that's going to happen. The, the, no current will flow through this, and it will be uh, idle. In fact, since no current is flowing, we will also have no magnetic field in the inductor. So this is pretty boring. To make something happen here, we simply disconnect 
this uh, source which has been holding the LC circuit in its uh, initial state. When we disconnect it, what happens is now suddenly we have current flow. The current flow uh, goes in this direction. We uh, create a magnetic field now in the inductor because as you know current creates a magnetic field and that charge wants to redistribute. So initially the voltage here is positive but what happens over time is eventually the charge is equalized so there is no net difference in charge across the capacitor so there is no voltage across the capacitor but the current is going full swing so the magnetic field is maximum in fact you may recall a previous course where you identified this state as having all the energy in the capacitor and now this state is having all the energy in the inductor. So what's happened at this point is that all the energy has moved from the capacitor to the inductor. It started off in the capacitor as an electric field. It ended up in the inductor in the form of magnetic fields. But things don't stop there. What happens now is we start redistributing charge in the opposite direction. So now we will start seeing positive charge appear down here, minus charges appear up here. The current is still flowing, propelled by the energy in the inductor, uh, but the magnetic field is decreasing because the current flow is decreasing. And what eventually happens is that we run out of current because the charge now is completely redistributed so that we have all the uh, plus charges on the bottom, all the minus charges on the top, no current flowing, so there could be no magnetic field. And what we have at the terminals here is minus V naught. We start off with plus V naught, now we has, have minus V naught. So what happens next? Well, the whole process begins in reverse because now all this charge wants to run around in the opposite direction and uh, we end up back uh, in, in effectively in this state, although without the uh, source. Now what happens when we get back to this state? Of course, we continue. So in the absence of loss, this process can continue indefinitely. We can move energy from the capacitor to the inductor back and forth indefinitely. So let's think about how we can use this. If we have this simple LC resonator, and we measure the voltage and we get this thing started, what we see over time, of course, is something that looks like this. Here's V, here's T, and we see that simply vary back and forth as a nice sinusoid indefinitely, and that by definition is a oscillator. The frequency of that oscillation, you should know from a previous course, is simply one over the square root of the inductance times the capacitance. And if that, of course, that's in radians per second. So we refer to that as a natural frequency of oscillation. Now something I want to point out here is that this is actually something we could use as a bandpass filter. In other words, we could imagine having terminals that come out here and terminals that come out here and apply an input signal over here and an output signal over here. And this is effectively a bandpass filter around this frequency of resonance. Now, this is a topic that we'll discuss in length in a future lecture when we talk about filters, but here it's relevant because we see that whatever signal we get started in this resonator, it will be around a frequency of omega naught. And other frequencies, if they're introduced, will tend to die out quickly because they will not be consistent with this natural frequency of resonance. So just a thought here, and we'll come back to this at a later time. In any event, the problem with using this as is, is intrinsic resistance. In practice, the inductor will have some resistance, the capacitor will have some resistance, there'll be some resistance in the thing that's connecting them, and I'll model that resistance uh, here. And of course, what me that means is that we will not have this, we will have something that looks more like this. We'll have a damped response. So each subsequent iteration will not come back to the original voltage. Instead, we'll just keep dropping until eventually all the energy is dissipated. So obviously, we're going to have to come up with some way to overcome this intrinsic resistance if we want a nice, steady signal. So let's summarize what we have in practice. 
two problems, basically. One is the one I just pointed out, how to overcome the internal resistance. The second problem we're going to have is how to implement the starting discontinuity. Remember, to get this process started, what I did is I applied a voltage source, charged up the capacitor, and then removed it. So in a practical oscillator, we are going to need to do something like that, or we're going to have to have something that will get this thing started. And that's known as the starting problem. We're going to deal with the internal resistance issue first. And as I just pointed out, the internal resistance will dampen and eventually halt the oscillation. One way you can imagine overcoming internal resistance is by nudging the input. So for example, if you have something that wants to do this, what you could do is on each period, you could apply some signal which causes a boost so that the next period then looks the same, and a boost here so that next period looks the same. So each subsequent period always comes back to the original starting point. This is actually known as a relaxation oscillator. It's fairly common in low frequency electronics, but rarely used in RF. And the reason is this nudging process, this process of kicking up the input on each period is relatively difficult to implement at RF frequencies. And it's really not necessary to do here. There's a simpler way to go about this. The better answer to overcoming internal resistance in RF oscillators is feedback. So let's talk about feedback. Here's a feedback oscillator. Now you'll note that I've suddenly switched gears here and completely eliminated the capacitor and the inductor. So we're starting off with a different idea here and we'll merge the two ideas a little bit later. The idea of the feedback oscillator is as follows. We have some input signal, X of T. We have some output signal, Y of T. Now Y of T is an amplification of X of T but we tap off some of the output and we feed it back through the system, which has a response H of omega, and we add it back to the input. So that's the feedback part. We can write an equation for that. If we stay in the frequency domain, we see that the output is A times X, right? But it's also A times Y, the output, times H of omega. Right, that's where we're adding this part back in. So the output depends on the input, but it also depends on the output. Now what we're interested in is the response of the overall system. In other words, y over x. And the response of the system, you can do the math yourself, you quickly find has the form a in the numerator and 1 minus a times h in the denominator. So now I'm repeating this at the top of the slide. We ask ourselves the question, under what conditions may the output of this particular structure be non-zero even if the input is zero? Because that's really what I want here. I want to apply nothing and have something come out. This equation tells us under what conditions that can occur. That can occur if the denominator is zero. Right? If the denominator is zero, then even if x is zero, y can be finite. So for the denominator to be zero, I, I have this expression, which implies two requirements. First, it implies that the magnitude of AH must be one, right? Because one minus one equals zero. But H potentially has some phase associated with it, as does possibly A. So the phase of A times H must be either zero or 2 pi, or some multiple of 2 pi, so that whatever comes back here adds in phase. So these two things are referred to as the Barkhausen criteria, or you could just call it the Barkhausen criterion, because really those are just elaborating on this idea. So we require the magnitude of A times H to be 1. We sometimes refer to that as loop gain. The loop gain should be 1. And the phase of the feedback path should be either 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, or so on. So let's just do a little sandy check here. The Barkhausen criteria are not sufficient conditions for stable oscillation. Simply having some structure that satisfies the Barkhausen criterion just says that you have this possibility of having output without having input.
In other words, the Barkhausen criteria address only how to sustain output in the absence of input, which is something we would like from a one-port oscillator. Barkhausen criteria say nothing about the presence or absence of oscillation. In other words, I never said what X was, uh, so there's nothing about the Barkhausen criteria that imply that there's an oscillation started or that I have any other signal present. It's simply, again, a way to talk about a circuit or a system which can produce output in the absence of input. It says nothing about how to start the oscillation. In other words, it says nothing about the starting problem. Although I will tell you that the Barkhausen criteria will be violated in order to cause this to happen. And here it is. Practical oscillators satisfy the Barkhausen criteria only approximately. Typically what we do is we let the loop gain be slightly greater than one and we maintain the oscillation once we achieve it by allowing the amplifier gain to depend on the input level. That is, we allow the amplifier to be slightly nonlinear. If I do this, then I can more easily overcome this thing we're calling the starting problem and get this whole thing started. Okay, so now we have this structure. And we know that an LC resonator is something that likes to oscillate. So now the question is, how do we use this structure to overcome the effect of dampening resistance so that this thing will produce a consistent, steady oscillation? Well, let me show you two schemes that aren't going to work. Right? One scheme, you might imagine, is simply to arrange the LC oscillator to be in the feedback path like this. The problem with that is that the feedback path will have infinite impedance at resonance, so there can be no feedback at resonance. In other words, this just becomes an open circuit and it doesn't go anywhere. The problem with this is that the feedback structure will simply freeze in its starting condition. What we really need is a way to integrate the LC resonator that allows the voltage and current across this parallel LC structure to vary independently of the feedback structure and limits the role of feedback to that of overcoming the intrinsic resistance. So we need some other way of wiring the LC into the feedback path that lets us keep the oscillation going without interfering too much with what's going on. So here's two schemes that will work. One scheme is known as the coal pit scheme. In the culpit scheme, what we do is we take the capacitor and we split it into two different capacitors. The input is applied as I've shown here, and the output is taken from in between the two capacitors. So now we have a way of applying feedback to the circuit that doesn't dominate the behavior of the circuit. In other words, now we have essentially this is feedback, and this is a way that we can allow the feedback to keep the oscillation going. Similarly, we could leave the capacitor alone and we could split the inductor and take the node between the inductors as the output. Again, we've achieved this goal of allowing the feedback to influence the circuit but without dominating the behavior of the circuit. And this is known as the Hartley scheme. By the way, I should mention that there's an alternative terminology for the resonator used in this way, and that is tank. So sometimes you'll hear people refer to the tank of an oscillator, and the tank is simply this structure. So there's a tank for a Colpitz oscillator, and there's the tank for a Hartley oscillator. So now we can move this one step closer to reality by now introducing this amplifier. Well, the natural thing to use for an amplifier is a transistor, now here I'm obviously implying a uh, bipolar implementation. This could just as easily be a FET implementation, but just for convenience I'm going to show it only one way as a BJT, in which case is common base. That means the base is grounded, the input is applied to the emitter, and the output is taken from the collector. That's what it means to be in common base configuration. So if I'm going to introduce this amplifier as a common base amplifier, then I have the transistor arranged this way. Of course, I'm going to have to bias it somehow, and I'm going to leave out those details because they aren't really convenient to consider at the moment, but I know I'm going to have to come back to that at some point. And then, of course, I'm going to have to introduce a capacitor here, 
Why? Because I need this point here to be a ground at RF, because that's what it means to be common base. But I need it to be isolated from ground at DC. So the purpose of this capacitor is simply to ensure the ground to RF while isolating or protecting the bias uh, at DC. Now since the output is taken from the collector in a common base amplifier, that's what we apply to this node up here. We take the output from in between the two capacitors in the Colpit scheme and we apply it back to the input. And here it's sufficient just to add the nodes because we're going to be adding currents. That's fine for adding currents. So this is our starting point. The task before us now is to turn this into a practical transistor circuit that behaves like an oscillator. Summarizing, we have an LC resonator, which we've shown as culprits here, but could, could have been Hartley. We have an amplifier here, which is common base, but could just as easily be some other configuration or another technology, such as a FET. And we have the addition here, and so we have the feedback path. This completes this lecture on the LC feedback oscillator concept.